All right. So I want you to keep your place in Leviticus. We're going to come back to Leviticus 19 and, you know, amen. Yes, we're preaching out of Leviticus. It is, I know it's a scary book of the Bible, especially Leviticus 18, 19, and 20. There's a lot of commandments. There's a lot of things that people tend to shy away from. And, you know, before I even get started with the sermon, I just want to make a point, and I, and I hope that everybody here is solid in their faith enough to not back down, to not make excuses for God's holy word when someone comes at you with, oh, but do you, do you really believe all that stuff in the Old Testament? Because you get atheists and people that hate God and people that don't like anything that the Bible says that want to pull apart sections and that, that to the world sound terrible. You know, where the Bible says if, if, um, if a child curses his father or mother, he's supposed to be put to death. That's one of the big ones that the atheists want to throw in your face and say, oh, do you really, how can you believe a book that says this? You know what? I do believe it. Amen and amen is what I say to that because this is God's word. I don't care what your morality is. I don't care what you think is right. I care what God thinks is right. And if God says something's right, I'm not going to back down from that. I'm not going to apologize for the word of God. It says what it says, and you know what? I believe it. Every word of God is pure, and every word of God is true. So yes, you know what? We're going to read Leviticus, and we're going to read God's laws, and Lord willing, we're going we're to try our best to keep God's laws. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 1. Keep your place here in Leviticus 19. We're coming right back to it. What I'm preaching on this evening is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. This is something that we all ought to have and we ought to be working on to make sure we maintain a proper, healthy fear of the Lord. The, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, in the you know, we went through this when we went through our Bible study in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The beginning of knowledge, just just getting a little bit of smarts is going to start with the fear of the Lord. Now, a lot of people might not understand, what does that mean? Why do I have to have a fear of God? I thought, I thought God's loving. I thought God's compassionate. I thought God's merciful and long-suffering. Yet He is all of those things. But you know what? He's also a father. He's also a judge. He's also a God that needs to be feared and reverenced. You show respect to God. You show reverence to God. You know what? The same way that my children ought to show respect and reverence to me. Now, do I love my children? Of course. Do I bless my children? Yes. Do I do nice things for them? Yes. Can, do, do they have to just always be walking on eggshells around me? No. But should they have a healthy fear of their own father? Yes. Absolutely they should. Of course they should. They should be fearing that if they're not keeping the rules that I've laid forth in my household, that their rear end is going to burn and tingle and not feel good at all, and they're probably going to end up being upset and crying about it. Because there's a consequence to their action. And this is the, the sole reason why we need to make sure that we fear the Lord is because there are consequences for our actions. We need to maintain the respect that God's law deserves to look to God's law and to understand we need to fear God for the very reason that when we screw up, when we, or not even just screw up, maybe we do something willfully, God forbid, we just want to do something, we want to do some certain sin, the fear of the Lord is going to help prevent you from doing those things. We need to have a healthy Fear of the Lord. Your fear of the Lord is directly tied to your faith. Now, the reason I say that is because unlike my children, they don't need to have that much faith in me to have a fear of me because they see me every single morning when they wake up. I'm at home. I'm, I'm around, you know, I'm around often enough to where they don't need some level of faith to know that I'm real and I exist. But with God, you have to remind yourself that God, for one, first of all, does 
see everything that you do. Not only does he see everything you do, the things that you do in secret when no one else is around, he even knows what's going on inside of your head. God knows everything. Unlike Santa Claus or Satan Claus that the world wants to put out there, who, who supposedly knows everything and knows whether you've been good or bad. No, God actually is real, and God does know when you've been good and when you've been bad, and God does know all of the things that you do, which is one reason we have to remember, hey, there is a God, God is real, and he knows all this stuff. He knows the thoughts and intents of my heart. He knows whether I have a wicked heart inside of me or not. He also knows the little things that maybe no one else knows, that maybe you've been so well at covering up and hiding and not letting anyone else know. God knows those things. And we have to remind ourselves of that so that we realize, no, I, you know what? I ought to fear God because God doesn't just let everything go. God is not that type of God that's just, oh, just because you're saved, have at it, sin all you want, no big deal. Do you think that's God's attitude? No, of course not. It's the same, you know, it's the same thing. I, don't, I have rules for my children. Nothing prevents them from being my child. They're always going to be my children. They were born from me. Of course, they're my children. Of course, I'm going to love them. But there's definitely consequences for their actions. They're definitely going to get disciplined when they break my laws or my commandments or my rules for them. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. I do turn to Revelation chapter 1. We need to oftentimes, you know, maybe just remind ourselves how we would feel just being in the presence of the Lord, like a physical presence of God, just being here, right here with you. We have many, many examples in the Bible of people who have come, you know, in, within God's presence. And we're not going to look at all of them, we're just going to look at one today. But what typically happens is when anybody comes in the presence of the Lord, they fall flat on their face as if they're dead. And they're scared to death because God is so powerful and exudes such a powerful presence that the, the, the best way that I could even try to explain, you know, not, not that I've personally been, you know, had that experience, but you get a glimpse into the power and the magnitude of God Whenever you're out, maybe in some type of a natural type of disaster, if, you're, if you've ever been around like a tornado or a hurricane or earthquakes, and you know, these are all things that happen when God does present himself. When God showed himself to Elijah, there was a, there was a fire and an earthquake and you know, a great rushing wind that broke the rocks. And, you know, all of these things happen when God's presence came in the presence of Elijah. And that feeling of helplessness, the feeling of, and, and what we see also later on in Revelation, when Jesus Christ comes back and people are going to be saying, fall on us to the rocks. And they're going to be going, trying to hide in the caves and in the mountains and saying, you know, hide us from the face of the lamb and doing whatever they can to just try to get away from them because they're scared to death. Because they know that their proud attitude and their arrogancy and their haughtiness that they've been walking around with and persecuting Christians and, and saying all manners of blasphemy out of their mouth is all coming to a head. And they go, oh, God is real. Jesus Christ is real. The Bible is true and he's coming back. Uh-oh. And they have no place to hide and nowhere to go because God's presence is awesome. It inspires awe and, and inspire, instills fear. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. This is the apostle John. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here we get a physical description of Jesus Christ in his glorified state. And look what John does, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is the Apostle John. 
This is someone who's already suffering for Christ's sake. This is someone who's doing the right thing. He's not living a wicked life. He would have no reason necessarily, right, to just be fearful in the presence of God because, hey, he's the Apostle John. He's doing right things. He's being persecuted already and, and imprisoned or banished for, for the word of Christ, for doing the things that are right. Yet, even, P and, and you see that multiple times, whether it be Moses or Elijah or any of these great men of God who are doing good things for God, all of them will fall on their face as if they're dead in the presence of God. Why? Because God is that powerful. And we need to, to take note of that and remember that. And remember, as you go about your day-to-day -day life and as you do the things that you do, however flippantly you act, it really does amaze me how flippant people can become about serving our almighty creator, God, Jehovah, in heaven our Savior, the Savior that saved your soul from an eternity of hell. How people end up getting a proud, flippant attitude when it comes to bestowing honor upon our Savior by not doing just the most basic things. Like, how about just praying to God and, and telling Him the things that, that you need? How about just things like giving thanks before you eat your food? Just, just offering up thanksgiving to God? Is it really that hard? People just get real flippant about it as if you deserve everything that you have. People get real flippant about just reading the Bible, reading and hearing instruction from God and just say, yeah, I'm too busy for that. Nope, don't have time for that today. How about coming to church? People get a really flippant attitude about it. Well, I already went once this week. I don't need to go back again. Not a big deal. And all the various things just adhering to very simple commands. We have very simple, straightforward commands from God in the Bible. But what happens oftentimes is that people choose to ignore this stuff because they stop thinking about God being real because God, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be that real in their life. Or they're just lifted up in their own pride or arrogance. Whatever the case may be, they kind of push God to the side and don't have, and definitely are demonstrating that they don't have a proper fear of the Lord. They're not fearing God. They're not fearing what God can do. We need to remember that, we, that, that God, and we're going to get to this in just a minute here. The Bible says in Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Go back, if you would, to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Now the world, the unsaved world, they need to have a fear of the Lord because they need to fear hell. They need to fear the ultimate consequence for their sins, which is an eternity of hell. They need to have that fear. We don't need to have that fear because we've already been saved. But we still need to fear the Lord nonetheless. As a child of God, as someone who will be disciplined by God, we absolutely need to maintain a proper, healthy fear and respect for the Lord. Now, in Leviticus 19, we read the whole chapter before we started uh, the sermon this evening. And one thing I just want to draw your attention to, one thing that we see over and over again, it's repeated multiple times in this passage, we see the phrase, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I'm the Lord your God. He gives commandments and he says, I am the Lord. Basically like, here's a commandment and here's why you need to follow it because I am the Lord. Now, he's not just stating that his name is Jehovah, right? So like if you were to get the Jehovah's Witness false version of the, of the Bible that they have, their New World Translation, you'll notice in the King James Version, first of all, in the King James Version, you see the word Lord in all caps. That is the name of Jehovah that's, that's translated as Lord in the Bible. In the New World Translation, they'll, they'll, they don't make that change. They make it all just Jehovah. But what he's stating here, he's not just stating his name, Jehovah, that I am Jehovah. He's letting them know that he's the boss. He's the Lord. 
because that's what his name literally means, the Lord. That's why it's translated in English as Lord. Even if it's in all caps, that's his name. His name is Lord. It means that he's the boss. He's the one in charge. He is God. I'm the Lord. And this is what he is explaining here in Leviticus 19. Let's look at Leviticus 19, verse number one. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He said, I want you to be like me. I'm holy. I'm spotless. I'm holy. And that's what I want you to be. I want you to be holy. Verse number three, ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. Now, when he says fear every man his mother and his father, he's talking about honoring your father and mother. He's referring to part of the Ten Commandments and keep my Sabbaths, another part of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. Verse number four, turn you not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. Verse number 12, jump down to verse 12. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of, the, of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him the wages of him that is hired. Shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Verse 14, thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. And just take a pause here real quick. What's he saying? Not to curse the dead or putting stumbling block before the blind. Because those are people who are easy targets, right? Those are people that you might look at and say like, hey, I could get away with this. I could take advantage of this person because they're deaf, because they're blind. I can easily manipulate and, and take care of these people. Not take care of them, but I could, I could um, rob these people or do evil to these people very easily. And he says, no, don't do those things. Fear God, okay? You don't, you, maybe you don't have to fear them because they're not going to be able to get back at you. Fear God. He says, I am the Lord. Verse 16, thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Jump down to verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. These are all the reasons. Look, why do we have to obey the commandments? Because I am the Lord. Because thus saith the Lord. Because I said so. Because I'm God. Because I'm the one in charge. This is what God is getting across to us in the book of Leviticus in this chapter here. Look at verse number 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be deviled by them. I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. We don't need any other reason to obey God than he's the Lord. He is God. He's in charge. And we need to have a healthy fear. And God just saying this is enough. He's saying, you know what? Fear me. I'm giving you all these rules and you better follow them. Why? Because I'm God. Because I am the Lord. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter number six. Deuteronomy chapter number six. We start reading in verse number one, the Bible reads, now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. So we see here, he's saying, I've given you all of these commandments. He says that thou mayest fear the Lord thy God. This is one way that we demonstrate that we do have a fear for God is when we're keeping his commandments. You know, that's also a way that we show that we love God. Isn't that kind of interesting? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
And God's saying here that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments. Why? Because they're intertwined. When we have the proper respect and fear of God, we're also showing our love for God by keeping his commandments. The, the love for God shows the respect that we have for him. And the fear shows our own self-preservation of not wanting to be punished because God said so. So I'm going to do it. And I'm going to have enough faith to trust that whatever God said is right and good anyways. We don't need to doubt the validity of God's word. We don't need to doubt whether or not, is this right to do? I don't know. Well, God said so, but I don't, I don't know. I have doubts. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to wonder. God's word is truth. Look at... Um, well, we'll keep, we're going to keep reading here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Don't, <coughs> don't ever, by the way, get sucked into the trap of thinking that your sin is not really a big deal to God. Now, we just had a discussion before the church service this evening. We we're talking about, you know, abominable and abominations and what that means. And that just means it's like something that's really hated and is very strongly hated. And we we're talking about how not every sin... Is the, has the same degree or same level of, of how bad it is. There, there's, there's sins, definitely some sins are worse than others. Okay, but just because that is true, just because there are some things that are even worse than others, does not mean that any sin is a light thing, that it's not that big of a deal. Because all sin is a big deal. All sin carries the punishment of hell. So when you put it in that perspective, okay, yeah, this one's a little bit worse than that one. Just like, you know, people who go to hell, there's going to be a hotter hell or a lower hell than some other places. But regardless, you're still in hell, right? So that's the similar way that the varying degrees of hell could be a good way to understand the varying degrees of sin. It's all really bad and nothing to just be flippant about. And just say, well, yeah, I do this, but so what? So does everybody else. This is one of the main things that keeps people from even getting saved sometimes because they don't realize they're lost and they need a savior. Because they think, well, I've never killed anybody. I've never done this sin. I've never done that sin. I'm pretty good. Oh, you mean telling a lie? Yeah, I've told a lie, but that doesn't deserve hell. They don't, they don't understand. They don't have the right concept of judgment and justice as laid forth by the Bible. And they don't realize how much of a sinner they really are because they're so flippant about it because maybe everyone else does it. And they just think, well, if everyone else does it, then it's not that bad. Wrong. At the beginning of the sermon, we read in the Bible, that God said, be ye holy for I am holy. That's God's level, his standard. That's what God wants for us is to be holy, to be separated, to be perfect. So don't get sucked into that trap of thinking that your sin is not really a big deal to God. Too many people have to learn the hard way that God is serious about this, about his commandments, and he wants you to fear him. When you lose that healthy fear, that's when you're likely to disregard God's word. When you stop having that, that, that concept of, of, you know what, I better watch what I do because God's watching, because I'm God's child and and. He's going to discipline me if I'm, if I'm not doing right. And oftentimes, unfortunately, people get wrapped up in a cycle of continuing to disobey God because they're getting more and more angry or bitter because things aren't working out so well in their life. So they start by disobeying God. God starts to chasten them, discipline them, punish them. And then in their mind, because they've already started going down that path, they start getting even more upset well, why, you know, all these bad things are happening and they push God farther and farther away and they end up causing themselves more and more problems. When the answer is right in front of you, just turn back to God and he could help you get through the rest of these things. But when, when you get that bad attitude, that wrong attitude, man, I've seen it happen way too many times. And look, you're all here tonight. Take heed to these things Keep it within your heart when you notice yourself starting to go off track. Don't get a proud attitude just thinking that, well, I could get away with it or, well, it's not that big of a deal because you won't. Because as a child of God, guess what? God loves you. 
And he loves you too much to, let, to allow you to continue down the wrong path without receiving any type of punishment or discipline or correction or instruction. Say, no, 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 get back over here. He loves you too much for that. It's not going to happen. And I really wish people can just realize sometimes it's like, we, we really need to take a self-examination. This is not meant to be looking on other people's problems, but when it comes to yourself and you seem to be having problem after problem after problem, maybe it's time to look and see, what am I doing wrong in God's eyes? Am I just being chastened? Sometimes it's like, how hard you need to be slapped upside the head before you realize God's chastening you. Just get right with him. Why do you have to hold on to your pet sins? Why can't you just give it up and do what's right and stop coming under the proverbial beating of the Lord? Just, just get right with God. Have a little bit of fear and realize you might be doing something wrong if things continue to go wrong in your life. Let's keep reading here. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. We, we ought to be loving God. And when we love God, we're going to fear him. We're going to keep his commandments. But he's, he wants all of our heart. He wants all of our soul. He wants all of our might. This is the dedication that he wants of us. And again, think about that when you consider your own personal relationship with God and your service to God, whether it be through your church attendance, prayer, Bible reading, soul winning, whatever it is, any aspect of your life that, that would be in association with God, your spiritual life, your, your walk, your walk in the Spirit, God wants all of your heart. He doesn't want some small segment. He wants you dedicated to Him. Verse number six, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. So what do we see happening here in Deuteronomy chapter 6? He's saying, I want you to love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. These things are important. These commandments are important. The word of God is important. Teach them diligently to your children. Make sure, if nothing else, they know the word of the Lord. Make sure that your children are taught this. Make sure that you are not ignoring this or being flippant about it or forgetting it, but you're talking about it when you rise up. You're talking about it when you lay down, when you walk by the way. Everything that you do, he's saying, this is how important God's word is. Make sure that you are going through this with your family, with your children. Beat it into their heads. This is important. And then he continues on to say, you know what? Because when things start to go really well for you, when I bless you, because you start down the right path, because you're listening to my words, you're hearing my instruction, then you're going to receive all these blessings and you're going to go into this land and you didn't have to do any work for this and I'm just going to give it to you and you're going to have all this stuff. He says, that's when you got to watch out because that's when you're most likely to stop fearing the Lord. That's when, when everything's going great, there's finances are going great, family's going great, you're walking with the Lord. Watch out. Beware. Lest thou forget the Lord, because way too many times that's what people do. God will bless somebody. He'll bless them financially, and then people start getting a big head about themselves as if they got all that stuff because they're so great, and they're something special, and no one else can do this but me, without even thinking, you know what? Maybe God just blessed me. 
Maybe that's it. It has nothing to do with me, but God decided to just give me a little bit of blessing. I'm going to be thankful to God and maintain my fear. And you say, you know what? God can, God's given to me and the Lord can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It could come and go, and that's fine. And if God chooses to bless me, great. I know in all things, how, you know, I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound. That's the attitude that we need to maintain because we really need to watch out when everything's going good. That's when people have a tendency to just turn away from the Lord. What do they need God for? This is why it's so difficult when we go out and preach the gospel in rich neighborhoods where people have multiple cars and their house is real nice and fancy and they have all the the landscaping done and, and you know they're in half a million dollar houses or whatever. This is why it's difficult because they did work hard in their life. They've accumulated a mass wealth and they've worked for everything and they have all this money, but they have no need. What do I need God for? What do I need to go to church for? What do I need anything? I have everything that I need right now. I have everything I could possibly want. And with that type of an attitude... That type of an attitude sends people straight to hell because they think they have everything when they, in reality they have absolutely nothing because those riches will be gone and burned up in an instant and it's very, very, very temporary. Whereas your soul is eternal. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? How much is that? How, what's the price tag on that? You don't have the amount of money for your eternal soul to buy your way out of hell. Verse 13 there says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Other than you know, unsaved people, this, even, th this type of thing even happens in my house. I notice that the most likely times for my children to forget the fear of their father is after... We've gone through a, a fun period, right? A time where maybe we take a little vacation or maybe, you know, we, we go out and we start doing things, especially if it's day after day and they get other family members come over and, and they're just having so much fun and everything's going so well. That is always seems to be the time when correction needs to take place because they seem to be doing so well that they think, well, you know what? I don't really need to listen to dad. Dad's telling me to do something I don't really want to do. And I've been having so much fun. I don't want to go clean my room. I don't want to do my school. I don't want to do whatever the case may be. See, when they're in the pattern and routine of doing those things, it's a lot easier. They, they already know, yeah, you know what? I need to fear dad. I need to fear that spanking because they're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get uh, punished if I don't do what I'm told. But when everything's going really well and they get on this, this cake and they're a little bit out of their normal routine, almost without fail, that's when it needs to come down. That's when reality needs to be brought back. And this is the same warning that God's given us. Hey, when things go good, just, just be careful. Just pay attention. Don't forget the Lord. Don't forget the fear of the Lord. Don't forget who He is. Respect Him. Keep His commandments. Don't get so caught up in, in all this fun. Because... The riches can, can distract people and lead you down the wrong path and lead you down a covetous path or lead you down um, into other sins that will be even worse. Jump down there to verse number 24 in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Bible says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Fearing God is for your own good. It is for your own good. Having this healthy fear and saying, you know what, I need to do what's right because God said so, because I fear what God can do to me, is for your benefit. You will do well in this life if you fear God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We saw that in Proverbs chapter 1. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27, the Bible reads, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. It's going to add years to your life. You know, people have all these different things you want to do. I want to eat healthy. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want, you know, I want a long life. And that's good. Praise God for that. But you really want to have prolonged days? Fear God. 
The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Proverbs 14, 26 says, And the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of light, life Excuse me, to depart from the snares of death. It's good for you. Proverbs 22, 4, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility, not letting yourself get lifted up with pride, and fearing God are riches, honor, and life. Those all sound like good things, don't they? Riches, honor, and life sounds good to me. Let's maintain a humble attitude and fear God. Turn, if you would, to um, Deuteronomy chapter number 8. I'm going to keep reading a few more verses for you from Proverbs because Proverbs gives great wisdom. It makes sense that there's multiple, multiple references here about fearing God because it's a wise thing to do. It's good for you. Proverbs 16, verse 6 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Don't let your heart deceive you by looking at people that are not being chastened by God and also don't have a fear of the Lord. So you can look at people and say, well, wait a minute. Why should I fear God? You know, look at these other people. They're getting away with it. They're doing the things that I want to do that God said not to do, but they're doing these things and they're getting away with it. Don't be deceived by that because they're not getting away with it. There's two things going on. If they're not being disciplined, they're not a child of God. They're a bastard and not a son. So remember that, that they're going to pay one day in hell. But number two, you don't always know what's going on behind closed doors and in their mind and in their heart. You don't know how miserable they might be just because an outward appearance looks great, looks like everything's fine. You don't always know the whole picture, so don't be deceived by these things that you see. Proverbs 23, 17 says, Let not thine heart envy sinners. Don't look, at, don't look at the people going out, going to the clubs, and getting drunk, and doing drugs, and doing all this fun stuff, and envy that, and be like, Oh man, I wish I could live my life like that. The Bible says, But be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Why? Because those, those ways are destruction and misery, death, anyways. It's just a facade. It's just this, this picture to try to get you sucked in to sinning. It's not real. None of it is. None of, none of it's going to bring you any lasting joy whatsoever. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you're a child of God, God will discipline you. He's going to punish you because he loves you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 5, the Bible reads, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So there, there's some biblical reference and evidence that what I was saying earlier about likening our relationship with God is very similar to relationship between a, a father and their children. The Bible says so right there that just as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Verse number six, therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Therefore, because of this reason, because it's the same way with a, with a dad with his kids. We need to fear God because God will chasten us. And you know, this is why we preach hard sermons here. This is why I preach on the subjects that I preach here. Because I love you. I love your children. And I definitely don't want to see your children or my children make the same mistakes that many of us adults have already made. And we've already had to learn the hard way. Because maybe you didn't hear the hard preaching. You didn't hear how God really feels about fornication. You didn't see, no one's told you that God actually puts a death penalty on adultery. Maybe no one's told you these things, but you know what? My children are going to hear them. Your children are going to hear them if you bring them here. And they can have a proper fear of the Lord that will help them to stay out of trouble. 
I know personally of someone that, that said that they did not commit fornication growing up as a teenager for the sole reason that they were scared to death of what God would do unto them if he did. Praise God for that. Because that's a big deal. Committing for, like, I don't care what the world tells you, committing fornication is a major sin. It is a big deal. It is something that you can't take back. Once you do it, you have to live with that sin for the rest of your life. You have something you could no longer give unto your spouse, and that's the gift of your virginity. Gone forever the moment that you decide to commit fornication and have that relationship outside of marriage. You could never get that back. It is gone forever. It's a one-time deal. Once it's gone, it's gone. And people don't hold a proper value for that. People realize that or recognize that, unfortunately, after it's too late. After you've already done that and then you get married and then you're like, man, I really love my wife or I really love my husband and I can't give them this because I've already defiled myself by being a whore or a whoremonger. I didn't know. Well, your kids are going to know. We need a healthy fear of the Lord. Look at verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse number 12. The Bible says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, <clears throat> to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. And again, for thy good. It's for your good that you keep the commandments of God. And he's saying, look, Israel, God's entreating Israel, saying, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? What is he even requiring of you but just to fear him? Just keep his commandments. This is what God wants you to do. He wants you just to follow him with all, with all your heart and soul. It's actually, you know, it may sound like it's everything, but it's actually not that, not that difficult. It's not, it's not that hard. We make things difficult, but what he's, what he's asking for is very simple. It's not complicated. It's a very simple thing, but it's up to us to make the decision. Am I going to love God with all my heart and soul? Am I going to walk in his ways? Am I going to fear God? Turn forward to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're going to see a few verses here on how to maintain a healthy fear. Because you say, Pastor Burson's I do want to fear God. I do love God. I do want to be right with God. I don't want the chastening of God. I, I, I want to do what's right. I still sin, but I want to do what's right. How can I, what can I do to try to maintain a healthy fear of the Lord so that when things go well, I'm not just flippantly disregarding God so that when things go good, I'm not forgetting the Lord, but I'm still remembering God. What can I do? What habits can I form? What can I do to make sure I maintain a healthy fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 17, look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. This is talking about a king. This is talking about what a king ought to do. That he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So he instructs the king to make his own copy of the Bible, of the laws of God. He's saying, first of all, the king needs to make his own copy. And when you copy things, you memorize things. You learn them better. You're already thinking about them. That's one way to help you to know those things. That's at least one way to ensure in this, in this scenario that the king has at least read through the law one time if he's had to copy out his own copy of the law. He should know the law by that point. And, but look at verse number 19, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. They say, but as a person, I'm not a king. Why does this apply to me? Well, it's a being applied to a king. First of all, because what other position are you going to be in that might possibly cause your head to be a little bit lifted up and get a little lofty and get an attitude over everyone else than having pretty much all the authority you can in a, in a particular area? 
So if this is the wisdom and the knowledge given to someone in that situation, don't you think it'll work for you too? To maintain that healthy fear of the Lord by reading every single day of your life. If you want to keep yourself humble and you want, and you want to keep your track right, read every single day of your life from your own Bible. That's a good start. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to start reading in verse number 11. Deuteronomy 31, 11. When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children which they have not known anything, which have not known anything, excuse me, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So what's another way to help you is by reading the Bible all the days of your life and then also hearing God's law read in church, in a congregation. Because they said, gather together, gather the men, the women, the children. You know, this is why we have congregation with kids in the church. We're a family integrated church. Why? This is what they did in Deuteronomy. They gathered everyone together. Why? Because everyone needs to hear God's laws. I don't care how old you are, you need to hear God's laws. From a young age, they need to be taught diligently God's laws. That's why we already read the section where he's like, put it as frontlets between your eyelids. Write it on your house so everywhere you look, put it on your hands. Everywhere you look, you're seeing the law of the Lord to keep yourself right. That's how important it is. That's why we have kids in the service. That's why we have everybody in the service and we're not separating people and this is going to help you to learn and to fear the Lord your God by coming in and hearing the preaching, hearing it regularly, hearing God's law preached and applied to your life. This will help you. Read the Bible every day at home and come to church and hear God's word preached. People say, well, why should we have to fear? Turn, if you would, back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, just a few pages back. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Would God really do anything bad to his people? To anyways, you know, would, any, would he really do anything? What do we really need to fear with God? Well, let's look at that a little bit. Deuteronomy 28, look at verse number 58. Verse number 58, the Bible says, If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, he said, if you don't do this, if you don't listen to my words, if you don't adhere to the law in order to fear the glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. So he says long continuance twice. He says it's going to last a long time. If you choose to disobey, if you choose to get out of my bed, guess what? I'm going to make thy plague. And when he says that make thy plagues wonderful, that's not a good thing. We use the word wonderful today usually to mean something that's nice and pleasant and good. Wonderful just means it's full of wonder, where people are just going to be amazed and wondering at God's awesome power, but not in a good way. It's like when, when he said that people's ears, both ears are going to tingle when they just hear what happens to Jerusalem. When they hear what happened to this city, what in the world happened to this people? These were God's people. What happened to them? They're going to be, it's, it's going to be wonderful because they're going to wonder at it. But it's not a good thing. People are going to be wondering at the plagues that you receive. He says, when you decide to just ignore God's word. And the plagues of thy seed. So we're passing on to children. Great plagues, long continuance, sore sickness, Long continuance, verse number 60. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. 
That sounds like a pretty good reason to fear to me. And who is he speaking to? His people, Israel. The people that he saved out of the house of bondage. The people that he gave things to, that he blessed, that he led into the promised land. The same people he's saying, okay, be careful that you do listen to me and you do keep my commandments and fear my name because if you don't, you're going to be plagued. You're going to be cursed. You're going to have all these problems come upon you. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter number 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm going to read for you from the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 10. Because we also need to remember that we always are fearing God over man. We need to maintain a fear of God, but we don't need to fear man. Oftentimes what gets people to forsake God's laws is man, is the, the feeling of fear by a family member, by someone called, oh, you're part of that cult. Oh, don't go to church. Oh, don't do this. Oh, don't go soul winning. Oh, don't. People telling you these things, trying to instill fear in your minds, fear to serve God. You cannot maintain a fear of whoever those people are and fear God at the same time when, it, when they're conflicting like that. The Bible is crystal clear on this subject that we need to fear God and not man. When you see the Bible telling you to do something, you do it no matter what anybody says to you. You do what's right. Because you know what? Ultimately, you're going to be the only one held responsible for that anyways. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 24, he said, the disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. He's giving his disciples some wisdom. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? He's giving them a warning saying, hey, they called Jesus Christ Satan. They called him Beelzebub. What do you think they're going to call you? Followers of Jesus Christ. And if they've done that to me, you can only imagine what they're going to say, things they're going to say to you. But after explaining that to him, after telling him that, he says, fear them not, therefore. He said, don't fear them. They've already called me Satan, so here, what, here's what you can expect. But for that reason, you don't have to fear them. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. He's saying, you don't have to be afraid. I don't care what people call you, whatever names they want to call you, they want to call you of Satan, it doesn't matter. Keep preaching. And then he, he closes with this in verse 28. He says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He says, man, the worst that they can do is kill your body. That's the worst. They could take physically your life away from you, but they can't take away your eternal life. They can't do anything to your soul. But you know who can? God. God has that power. God has the power to cast souls into hell. He said, that's who you need to remember. That's who you need to fear. That's what, if, if you're going to fear anybody, you know, don't fear the one that's telling you not to do something for God. Fear God, the one who's telling you to do something for him. That's where, that's where the line's drawn every single time. Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap things up here. We're almost done. Jeremiah chapter number 5. Look at verse number 21. The Bible reads, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So who are we talking to here? Foolish people, without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they, can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. He's saying, aren't you going to fear me? Think about how great and powerful God is to have made this whole earth, the whole planet, everything that you see that was created by God, the mountains, the valleys, the hills, the, the, the streams, the rivers, the oceans, Everything was made by God. And he's saying all of this sand, and you look at all the shores, all that sand that's just, pi it's just piled up enough to hold the water back. In every area, he's saying, I did that. 
Can you imagine man trying to contain all of the water that is found on this earth and doing something to make a boundary and say, you know what, the water's going to come up to here and that's it. God said, I did that. I did that. And you're not going to tremble before me? You're not going to fear before me? Verse 23, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. And just like almost everything, it all starts in your heart. When it comes to sin, when it comes to fearing God, when it comes to keeping His commandments, whatever case may be, it all starts in your heart. Your heart has to be right. Soften up your heart. Don't let your heart get hardened. The more you reject God's word and his teaching, your heart becomes harder and harder and harder. And it's going to be harder for you to get back right and to get things back on track. Don't have the revolting and rebellious heart that we see the children of Israel had, that we see these bad examples being brought forth for our own learning. Don't have that. This people are the revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Look at verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. Your sins have withholden good things. God wants to give good things to you. God wants to bless you because he loves you as his child. But our sins, our actions, not listening to God's commandment, is going to keep those good things from happening. What are the good things that you really want in your life that you feel have been withholden from you? It's probably easy to think about those things. Now think about your heart and ask yourself, are these things being withholden from me because of my sins? Do I not have a proper fear of God? Am I not realizing that maybe God is withholding things from me because I am wrong, because I am not right with God? 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 reads, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He's saying, let's clean up our life. Let's get our act together. Let's cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of this flesh. Let's get the sin out of our life and perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord fearing God and keeping his commandments. The conclusion of the whole matter. I love when there's conclusions in the Bible when things are concluded. I like in Romans chapter 3, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I love that because you have all kinds of doctrine and teaching and great information being given to you and then they're just like, and here's what we conclude. We conclude all under sin. We conclude that salvation is by grace through faith and that you don't need to work at it. You don't need the deeds of the law. Well, in Ecclesiastes, we also have an, a conclusion at the end of the entire book. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the whole book of Ecclesiastes gets closed out in verse number 13 saying, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He's saying this is the conclusion of the whole thing. He says just fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because everything that you do, God is going to judge. So whether it's good, whether it's evil. Remember that. Fear God and keep his commandments. It is for your benefit. It is something that we need to make sure that we are doing on a regular basis. I know none of us is perfect, but how about we start with our heart? How about we start with an attitude and a mindset that says, I love God's word. 
I love God's law. I'm going to do my best to read therein all the days of my life. I'm not going to skip a day. We're going to read every single day. We're going to go to church and hear God's law preached. We're going to respect God. I'm going to fear God because I know that he is a loving father. And I know that whatever God has commanded is for my own good. The rules that we have in place for my children at my house, they're not rules because we don't like them. It's because we want them to be healthy. We don't let them stay up to all hours of the night because they need rest. We don't let them just eat whatever they want. We do make them eat vegetables. We make them eat certain foods. Why? Because we want them to be healthy because it's good for them. Because we know more than a seven-year-old knows or a four-year-old or a six-year-old of what is good for them. We know more than that. So we make these rules that they have to follow because we love them. And when they don't follow the rules, they're going to be punished because there are consequences for your actions. Well, guess what? God knows way more than we know what is good for us. We have a tendency to think like a rebellious, you know, teenage child. I know what's best for you. Oh, my parents are stupid. No one knows anything. I know what's right. I'm going to prove everyone wrong. And what do they do? They end up getting in all kinds of trouble. Let's not have that attitude with God. Let's, let's, let's humble ourselves and say, God made us. God has all the knowledge of the universe. He created us. He knows how our bodies work. He knows the temptations we have. He made us. But let's work with, through God's creation with the instructions that he's given us. I guarantee you, your life will be full of so much more joy the closer you can follow God's instructions. When we break his commandments, it only brings sorrow and pain. And when we keep them, it's going to bring joy and peace. It's good for you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, so much, dear God, for loving us enough to just give us all of this great wisdom and instruction. God, help us all to have the, the faith, to have the fear of the Lord, to know that you love us and, that, and to know that you will correct us and keep us in line as your children. God, help our hearts to be softened. Help us to um, start with our hearts and just have that desire to want to serve you and to do the things that, that you've commanded us to do and help us to understand and just to remember on a regular basis that you do these things for us. They're good for us and our, our days will be lengthened and we will have peace and joy and comfort and all the goodness that you can provide if we would just listen to you and respect your commands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.